I guess you could say that I'm something of a life affirmer, at least in terms of my own life. Um, I believe that my life is worth it, is worth living, um, but I won't comment on anyone else's. Um, I think that um, life really kind of has no value one way or another. Um, now that's, <laughs> in most circles, that's a pretty shocking thing to say, right? Um, but I mean, like, in terms of being alive, it's kind of just neutral, the state of existing. Um, it can be good, it can be bad, it can be worth it, it can be not worth it. Um, I think that it's far too sweeping a statement to say that life is worth living or life is not worth living. When I, um, when I was in my mid-twenties, I went through a bout of severe depression, near psychotic depression. Um, and one of the things that helped me snap out of it, and I think that it, it's true of many people who had gone through, who've gone through depression, uh, is um, William Styron's novella, Darkness Visible where he rather recklessly, I guess, explores these ideas and puts you into the head of a severely depressed individual. And uh, it's been called a masterpiece of literary shorthand describing what it's like being depressed. And it, you know, struck me to the core when I read it and it helped me in my recovery. And he dealt with the issue, is life worth living? Um, and I think that it's fair to say that he thinks that it is, or he thought that it is. I don't know if he's still alive, but I was never fully convinced of that. Now, it's not a case of, again, me saying that life is or isn't worth living. Um, I kind of, again, I'm a fence sitter on this, not some, or not even a fence sitter. It's kind of. I want qualified or ambiguous responses to that, or I'll give qualified or, res or ambiguous responses because I can see from just looking at from the outside where you really can't really tell whether or not somebody's life is worth living, but it looks as though, say, um, a gazillionaire who inherited all their money, doesn't have to work, doesn't have any headaches, doesn't have any problems, um, who kind of breezes through life with few blips, um, you would say, okay, that life is worth living. Um, whereas somebody who was born disabled, poor, penniless, illiterate, um, mentally disabled or whatever in a third world slum, you'd sort of go, that isn't a life worth living. Um, now, I don't know. Uh, there are cases, I'm sure, of rich, powerful, or not even powerful, rich and well provided for uh, people offing themselves. And there are cases of people who are in the worst possible circumstances saying that, you know, I'd do it all over again type thing. Like, you know, um, Stephen Hawking obviously comes to mind. Um, although he was very famous and he had a wonderful mind. Um, but, you know, you would sort of think that a guy imprisoned in that body mind going through the cosmos or not would kind of, yeah, who wants to live like that? But by all accounts, he enjoyed his life. Okay, so you really can't say one way or another. There's no litmus test to say that life is or is not worth living. Um, but again, in terms of my own life, I'm determined to get the most out of it. And the reason for that is I stared that demon right in the face at a formative period in my life where I said, you know, when I was in my near psychotic depression, where, you know, movement is difficult, and all you can do is sit there um, I hope that gets frozen as my, uh, as my photograph. I like putting the worst possible face on my video, uh, icons. Um, but for some reason it never occurred to me to kill myself. Um, I never really wanted to kill myself because for some reason I was so depressed that I sort of had this weird and completely illogical and irrational and unfounded view that suicide wouldn't solve my problems. <laughs> Um, I don't really believe in an afterlife. I didn't at the time either. Um, but I don't know. It just seemed that 
that wasn't what was going to do it. Um, what seemed to sort of do it is entertaining the idea of suicide. Saying, okay, do I want to kill myself? No, I don't. Okay. Um, now, I want to qualify that by saying that I agree with Camus when he says thoughts of suicide have gotten me through a very, uh, a very many bad nights. In other words, um, I can take whatever life throws at me because me and a straight razor makes you um, my slave and me your master, all you horrible sufferings. And you can all go to hell the second that I decide that you go to hell by opening my veins in the bathtub. Now, that's more or less just a mental exercise, I think, that a lot of depressed people go through to just sort of cope with how things are at the moment. It, it's not necessarily that people want to kill themselves. Um, and that's how I did it. It was more or less the aphorism from the Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying. So I decided, all right, I'm not going to kill myself. I'm here. I might as well live. So I decided to live. Um, I believe that I made the right choice, but at the end of the day, I don't know. I could end up in something equivalent of Auschwitz next week, for all I know. My life could take a nosedive at any moment. Um, that can happen to any of us, right? Or, or some weird concatenation of events. I could become monstrously rich next week as well. I don't know. Um, probably it'll just keep going on its regular humdrum way. But it, it, at the end of the day, that get busy living or get busy dying thing, which was kind of Styron's message as well, um, convinced me that there is, there is merit in attempting to extract value from one's own existence. Merit in and of itself. Maybe I'll never be blissfully happy or whatever the way you imagined you would be when you were a child, or maybe perhaps you were when you were a child. Um, but it does seem to be worth the headache to do all this. Um, my life seems to be worth the bother. And at the end of the day, again, human mortality will wipe the slate clean, and no matter how good or bad my life is. Um, now, this is stuff that I've only discussed with a select few people, um, with a lot of people on the internet, I guess. Um, and I've gotten kind of a of a reputation that I don't necessarily agree with as a life affirmer, um, at least among those who are into that kind of thing on YouTube. I've said all along that I'm not opposed to things like suicide or antinatalism or whatever. In, in fact, I'm kind of a proponent in many ways of practically suicide on demand. Uh, if you just don't want to live anymore, you should have the means to check out. Um, Unlike most Canadians, I actually got to know the Aboriginal Canadian community. Um, they live kind of a, in a kind of a, a situation that's somewhat apart from the mainstream of Canada. And if you walk down any Canadian city streets, you see people that are in pretty rough shape. Um, and there's a critical mass of them who are Aboriginal Canadians, winos, addicts cheap prostitutes, this sort of thing. Now, the overwhelming consensus, I believe, among Canadians is pity. People feel sorry for these people. I don't think people necessarily feel all that guilty about it, um, but definitely the feeling is pity towards them. And, and as a consequence, they, or I don't even know if it is as a consequence, but they do have an abnormally high suicide rate. Now, talking to Native people over the years, Native Canadians, and calling somebody Native in Canada is not in any way politically incorrect, just so you know, it may be politically incorrect elsewhere, but that's kind of the way you talk, you use the term in Canada. They have a terrible, well, terribly high suicide rate, I guess you would call it, or an abnormally high suicide rate. Now, you sort of look at the way some of them live, and you sort of see, okay, yeah, that, yeah, I get it, you just, I, who, who wants to live like that, you know? crackhead who's also a prostitute and a petty thief and, you know, been beaten up on a regular basis or whatever. Um, yeah, I get it. 
your life is hell, so you put an end to your sufferings. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say something somewhat controversial, um, because I'm talking about somebody else's culture, it's not my own. Um, I think that they're they, in as much as Aboriginal Canadians are a they, their view of suicide is different from the Western one. Um, if you've ever seen the series Rome, there was a lot of suicides in that. And the suicides often took place um, when someone had attempted something very big and failed. And they wanted to, you know, say they wanted to take over the Rome itself. And they failed, so they killed themselves. Now, it wasn't despair that did it. They just were not willing to live on in reduced circumstances. Their pride, their honor, all this sort of thing was at stake. And in a sense, their deaths were not necessarily the result of depression or despondency. Uh, that's warrior ethics, right? The harakiri or seppuku, where the warrior kills himself because he's been defeated in battle and he the, the option of becoming someone else's underling is just not on for him. He will live under, like, under, by his own rules, or that's it. He won't live at all. And um, it's not depression. It's, I guess it's failure, or it's understanding when you're kind of checkmated by the rules that you yourself have accepted. Now, Aboriginal Canadian culture is definitely a warrior culture, especially where I live, on the plains, uh, the Great Plains. They were probably one of the most developed warrior cultures, even among the warrior cultures of the Americas. That's basically all that they did, was they, they fought. And the wars in the eastern woodlands and places like that were kind of easy for the Europeans to defeat the native Canadians. Um, but in, say, in the United States, fighting the people of the plains, the Europeans ran into real trouble because they were truly warrior people and um, they took to things like guerrilla warfare or whatever uh, very well and you needed a hundred white soldiers to defeat one native American. So they would have a strong warrior ethic. And the warrior ethic says, if you're snookered by events, the honorable thing to do is to kill yourself. Um, now, I get it, though, that people who are in straightened circumstances, who are addicted or who, are, who have been abused all their life, sexually, physically, emotionally, whatever, which, unfortunately, a lot of Native Canadians are in that boat, are more likely to kill themselves. But I also think that sort of sense that um, I've had a run of it, it didn't go my way, fuck it, I'm out of here. Um, that may be an element in their thinking. Again, I'm saying they, and that's, i got to watch it around this sort of thing, but I'm going to say it anyway, and I, hopefully people will just see what I'm trying to get at here. I'm not trying to otherize Aboriginal Canadians in any way at all, but I've gotten to know them, and I believe that in a sense, or at least more than most Canadians, non-Aboriginal Canadians, I know the Native Canadians for what they are. Not for what we idealize them as, not Dances with Wolves, and not the um, stereotypical drunken urban Native. I mean the people that just live your kind of mainstream Native Canadian life, and um, are pretty, what we would say, and this is politically incorrect, we'd say really res. In other words, they're from a reservation who may, you know, they may speak their own language, um, practice their own faith, all that sort of thing. I dated a Native Canadian woman um, a few years before I married my wife, um, and she was a real, what we would call a real Native person. She had... Um, she spoke three languages. Her first language was Swampy Cree. Now, that's a fascinating thing because that's the language spoken by maybe 1,500 people. Her second language is French, and her third language is English. So she was like a real backwoods native Canadian. And, you know, talking to her and talking to her family and her friends and other native Canadians in my neighborhood, you know, you notice that 
there's a there's a difference in mentality, a large difference in mentality. And I'll be honest, I've traveled the world and I found few people that I had that I, or few people that I had less in common with than Native Canadians. Now, it wasn't that there was any problem with the fact that we were faced each other uh, opposite this vast cultural gap uh, divide, but it, you just recognize even when there's goodwill, i.e. even when I'm having a relationship with a Native Canadian woman, we ain't the same in many ways. <laughs> um, and I get the impression that they kind of don't take life overall as seriously as we do. Um, now, it's not so much that they don't take life seriously enough, as I think we take life a little bit too seriously. Like if you read about Native Canadian poetry and uh, their songs and things like that, a lot of them deal with things like, well, nothing lives very long, only earth and sky last forever. What's, what's the problem? You know, we're, we're all going to die one day, and the best thing to do is to die on your own terms. Um, now, I'm not going to say that that is the reason for the high Native Canadian suicide rate, but I believe that it's a contributing factor to it. There's still that warrior outlook that, okay, I'm defeated and I'm not going to live like a slave, so I'm out of here. Um, and that kind of throws the whole idea of suicide into question, the way that... Um, the way that we view it, I guess, in the West, or the way the modern world tends to view it. We see it as a disaster, a catastrophe, or whatever, something that leaves us wondering what's wrong. You know, us, the, we the living, are blindsided by the fact that somebody we knew committed suicide. Uh, it's an interesting comment on hero worship, uh, where people freak out, and, you know, when people like Anthony Bourdain commit suicide, you get the sense that people really did idealize this guy, or idolize him. Like, they took their life cues from this guy. Like, this fake persona that appears on the screen, or I shouldn't say it's fake, it's him, but it's just something that he, it's just his persona in the proper sense of the word, uh, a personality that he's created while he's in front of a camera, or while he's in front of somebody who is watching him being himself. Um... What's behind all of that? Well, people seem to think that what's on the surface is what is actually going on, which I guess in many cases it would be. But in other cases, it's not what we think. Um, a lot of people that I work with were shocked by Bourdain's suicide, and I got into the conversation with a few of them that were talking about it with my disturbing ideas on this subject. And a lot of people liked what I had to say, but were disturbed by it. Because I'm of the opinion that maybe he had a good life. And maybe it was just, in some strange way, in his own mind, it was time to check out. Um, maybe he was horribly addicted, depressed, etc., etc., and decided to kill himself. There's any number of reasons why somebody would kill themselves. Um, as I said, in ancient Rome, um, it was almost um, a big, you know, to the fates when you when you committed suicide. You say, see, I almost became something really big, and right when retribution, nemesis, was going to come and get me, I checked out. Ha ha. Push the ejector button. And uh, that was that. I knew what I was doing from the beginning. I knew that, you know, trying to become dictator of Rome or the, trying to lead a rebellion or something like this was dangerous stuff that could result in my death. But before I had to face any of the consequences, I hit the ejector button, and phew, there, I was out of there. Um, that's not the same thing as dying because of despair or depression. Um, are there other ways to look at suicide? I think that there are. Um, and I don't think that suicide really sort of says anything one way or another in terms of um, the value of human life, or... I, sh I suppose in probably the majority of cases, it would say something about the value of each individual's life. If you kill yourself, there's something, there's a reason why you're doing it, right? Um, or one would presume there is. And presumably, if your life was going well, you wouldn't want to off yourself. 
Um, but again, it might have been, with some people, it might have been a calculated risk. I'm going to bet everything on black, and then red comes up on the roulette board, or the roulette wheel. So, okay, well, I tried. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Um, again, there are lots of instances of this in history. Um, you know, the like in The Godfather Part Two, the guy tried to take over... Um, the mob from Michael Corleone, he failed, so he slit his wrists in his bathtub. Honorable way to die, um, according to the weird laws that the mob operates under. He wasn't depressed. He just screwed up. He didn't He didn't take over. He was dead. He'd taken on a, a guy that was much more powerful than he was, and he failed. But he was not a depressed person. He didn't think that life was bad. He didn't think that his own life sucked. He just sized up the situation and said, yep, <laughs> I'm cornered. Bye. Um, again, I think that suicide is something that we have to be careful about. I'm not saying suicide is a good thing. <laughs> Certainly not. Um, but what I am saying is it's not as cut and dried as one might think. Um, it's up there with what is the value of death. You know, what... Is death uh, a release from our sufferings, or is death the end of our joys? It, it could be both, right? Um, I always like to sort of make that point. No matter how bad your life is, your sufferings will end. Sufferings are time-dependent, i.e. temporary. It doesn't matter how bad they get, they'll come to an end. So, in that sense, death is a good thing. Unless, of course, you're in the, that part of your life where everything is going wonderfully, and then you might not like the fact that you've suddenly gotten terminal cancer or something like that. Um, but anyway, it's just a very interesting subject, and it's very one that's very um, fascinating for me, uh, the question of, is life worth living? And again, I kind of refuse to answer it one way or another. Um but I got a really interesting opportunity to discuss it with people that wouldn't ordinarily even consider going there. Uh, but one of the, when one of their heroes, the people that they look up to, decides to off themselves, they're kind of forced to do it. Um, either that or they just make excuses and go into denial, which I guess is what almost everybody does when one of their idols does something like this. Um, yeah, Anthony, rest in peace, but, uh, as for me, I choose life. <laughs>